One of the profound aspects of the material selections that we've chosen is that they're really low embodied carbon materials. Kate and David came to us with a very interesting brief. On the one hand, they wanted to create a beautiful contemporary home that would have spaces for themselves, for their interstate guests, as well as children and grandchildren. But probably the more intriguing aspect for us was the wish to create one of the most sustainable homes in Australia. Whilst generous, the block is surrounded on all sides by neighbours. So there was this wish to create a really private haven. And in order to do that, we developed this idea of this central courtyard. And the central courtyard would be a space that all the spaces of the house would wrap themselves around. It would give each room access to natural light, to sun and to natural ventilation. It would also allow for this constant interaction with the garden and the landscape, so it was a way of bringing the landscape deep into the home. We imagine that as part of their daily rituals, on the ground level you would always be walking through the corridor and next to that beautiful planted pond. When using the upper levels, we would be circulating next to the courtyard, but next to that hand-woven rattan screen, which has a beautiful dappled light. This materials petal really required a strong focus on, on locally sourced and natural materials. We looked at a number of different materials initially and we settled on Mangambia limestone and a beautiful material that has natural features, natural fossils being a limestone, but also very easy to cut. And so the moment we chose that material in a way that began to unfold this conceptual idea of carving and sculpting and incising so when we initially visualised the house, in some ways we realised that we were creating a fairly hard exterior. So one of the initial impressions that we provided for them was this idea of this stone exterior at the front uh, sitting in this field of native grasses that would kind of move with the wind. As we were first laying out the plan, it was quite evident to us that with the deeper section of the side being at the east end, that would be a fantastic place to put the main living spaces because that would provide a direct aspect to the larger section of garden where the natural pool is. It would also allow us to create a very generous opening back to the Chinese elm tree. Grounded Gardens, the landscape designers did a beautiful job of creating this quite diverse range of gardens, so that garden with a Chinese elm tree is meant to be a more shady and soft garden to look at onto. Having then inserted the courtyard into the centre of the house, the bedrooms naturally were pushed towards the western, towards the street, and having their own private gardens to look at. The topography of the house was being able to put some fairly important rooms for Kate and David down into a basement level. The upper level is generally primarily about bedrooms. So there's uh, two rooms, which are for children and grandchildren on the one side, and a guest suite. As part of the living building challenge, there was a certain amount of food production requirement. And whilst on the one hand, the, the garden at ground level includes a lot of natives and edibles, we still didn't have enough. So we created on top of the dining room a space designated for grow beds. And that is a fantastic space for Kate, who loves her cooking, to grow herbs and other vegetables. And so food can be prepared fresh with those ingredients. Having chosen the Mangambia limestone as our exterior cladding, as architects that are very interested in the craft, once we decided on the stone, we really looked at how you might express those openings. You'll notice the openings are very deep, very deep reveals, because that's what stone likes to be. We started to look into the palette for both the exterior and interior as a more holistic proposition. We decided 
that the approach would be to limit the pallet to two materials, stone and timber. And this was really to create this sense of a really natural and comfortable environment and materials that would weather really well over time. The stone will show signs of wear and the timber will age to a silver grey, so it'll show the passing of time. It's not a static appearance, it's something that's expected to change and mature the same way the landscape will grow around it and mature with it. The timber internally has a really interesting story. It's a hydrowood oak that comes from Tassie, from Lake Pyman, where in the 1940s the valley was flooded. And so that has now started to be harvested and air dried and kiln dried to produce this beautiful timber. We use that for timber flooring, for ceilings, also for all the joineries. To the exterior, the material for all the claddings is a recycled black butt from Kempsey. And it was used for the claddings on the study and the dining room, as well as the window frames. One of the things that fascinates me is when I look at what we've done with the courtyard timber mullions is to imagine the amazing large sections of roof members that would have once occupied a factory and which have now been repurposed and used for the home. One of the profound aspects of the material selections that we've chosen is that they're really low embodied carbon materials. Obviously the timber in many ways is actually a positive carbon reduction and because it is a sustainably sourced material that works really well. But both the, the limestone and even the siltstone that's on the floor, they're products more or less directly quarried. There's very minimal intervention other than transporting them to site and having come from, you know, reasonably close, the stone comes directly from Adelaide, the siltstone from a quarry in Aitzewald in Queensland. We know that the dining table is in many ways the heart of the home. That's where a lot of important moments are spent. And so in this case, the table was built with the same hydro wood. We developed the table to have this, what we call a linear lazy Susan. So it's a, a slot in the middle of the table that allows a couple of trays to be able to slide back and forth, uh, which will have cheese or breads or things like that when they entertain. One of the more interesting bits of joinery is the dividing unit between the living and dining room. On the living room side, it opens up to reveal a brass lined bar. The middle of it has a television that pops up and then on the kitchen side, it has a, an in-situ concrete bench and drawers that are lined in fabric to store all the good cutlery and, and act as a servery. The Living Building Challenge is quite a comprehensive sustainability agenda, but the one that I guess impacts our architectural work the most is the selection of materials. There's a list of red list materials that can't be used. And that meant that every single material, every paint, every silicon, every grout, every piece of timber, concrete, everything you see or don't see in the fabric of this house was tested to make sure that none of those harmful chemicals were present. Passive House ostensibly is a system that's worked incredibly well with the Living Building Challenge to achieve this off-grid performance. And that effectively means that the house generates all the water and power that it needs and it similarly has to remove all waste within the block itself. There are high levels of insulation in the walls. All the walls have an internal air tightness membrane which achieves an incredibly low amount of air leakage compared to a standard home. The glass is triple glazed so it's really highly performing. So that really efficient envelope then combines with a passive house ventilation strategy where there's a gentle amount of fresh air that's constantly delivered into the building. And what's sophisticated about the system is that air is constantly coming in and being expelled, but all the energy that's gone into cooling or heating that air is captured in a heat recovery. So it's a really efficient and low energy way of conditioning the house. 
there's a really low energy demand which can be met through a PV cell system that is on the roof with batteries in the garage. The other interesting criteria for the living building challenge is that the house must not just be off grid, it must actually export 5% power back into the grid. There's a certain component of uh, generosity about the living building challenge that is about doing good, not just minimizing the bad that we do with our buildings. Other systems of water are also really important. Typically, it would be a plug and play into the grid systems of water and sewer. In this case, the systems are far more sophisticated. So water is collected on the roof and stored in underground rainwater tanks buried under the garden. That is filtered to a really high level through a unit in the plant room. That's used to provide all the portable water needs. The wastewater then from the vanities and the showers is actually repurposed and treated in a grey water treatment plant. And that water then is used to flush the toilets, for the washing machine, as well as the irrigation of the garden. The black water that comes from the toilets is treated on site in a black water treatment plant to a very high level, so it's quite a sophisticated piece of equipment. The outcome of that is filtered in underground subsurface lines. We're all well aware that there's a climate crisis. Everything we do, whether it's our housing or other buildings, our transportation, we simply have to find better ways to do things if our planet's going to survive and we're going to leave a decent legacy to our children and, and their children. We probably enjoyed the journey on this particular house because what it showed us is that we can actually achieve a beautiful architectural outcome, a well-considered response to our client's brief and to the site but also in a way that has a really minimal impact on the environment.